In our first study, we thought about the, the beginnings of the nation of Israel, didn't we? We, we looked at Abraham, who's not only the, the father of the Jewish nation naturally, but, but spiritually, he's the one who's held up as, as an example of faith for all who are going to come into the promises to follow. We also saw how easily that the children of Israel left the heritage that was theirs to serve their own agendas. They, they lost sight, didn't they, of the simplicity of what it is that God wanted. He wanted them to be faithful, to cultivate his righteousness, so judgment and justice, to, to make decisions in their lives that are based on his right ways. Instead of trying to follow God's right ways, they sought to establish their own, establish their own righteousness. And that's particularly brought out for, in Romans, in Romans 9, actually. So you've got your Bibles open, but just flip back a page to, to Romans 9. Now, the structure of this letter, this letter to the Romans, has been all about seeing the need for faith. You know, that, that's the key statement in Romans chapter 1, at the beginning, the just shall live by faith. Remember, that's what we touched on, God reassuring Habakkuk when he was worrying about suffering and the difficulties of the, the Babylonians being used to uh, teach Israel a lesson. And him saying, how could you possibly do, you know, use this uh, terrible nation to do that? And God's reassurance to him is the just shall live by faith. Well, that verse, Habakkuk 2 and verse 4, is cited three times in the New Testament absolutely fundamental. One in Galatians 3, we didn't point it out, one in Hebrews 10, and here in Romans and chapter 1, the just shall live by faith. And that is shown, that point of the just living by faith is shown by looking back to the example of Abraham. So let's just quickly see this. Chapter 4 of Romans, just have a quick flick to. So in a way, um, so be careful how I say this, things like this, but um, I will anyway. Um, from Romans 1, verse 18, to Romans 3, the end of Romans 3, you could almost put it in brackets, okay? That Romans 1, verse 17, that says, the just shall live by faith. The example of that, then, is in Abraham, where in Romans 4, it says then in verse 3, what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, so that's Abraham had faith, and it was counted to him for righteousness. He was counted just. The just shall live by faith. Those two Greek words are the Greek words you're seeing in Romans 1 and verse 17. So what's the bit in between about? It's about the fact that we are all condemned by sin, and God's solution is the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we've got to do is put our faith in that. So we trust then that his grace is sufficient for us. Uh, if you were kind of going through Romans, Romans 5 is like one of my favorite chapters. You know, I tell you why. Because Romans 5 helps us to see the power of God's grace. And this is the, the example he gives us. He says, can you understand the impact of Adam's sin? And all of us can. Like we're, we're dying, we're kind of things, like, as, as, our, as ourselves are kind of falling apart, aren't we? We see the world in which we live. We recognize the impact of Adam's sin. And if we were asked to measure the impact of Adam's sin, if I, if I said, you know, between here and here, what's the impact of Adam's sin? I'm sure every one of you would say, well, it's from there to there. If I said to you, well, if we're trying to measure it from the edge of this room to the edge of that room, on a scale, how would you see the impact of Adam's sin? You would say, it's from there to there. It's massive. It's all encompassing, the impact of sin. And yet Romans 5 says this, God's grace is much more. How phenomenal is that? God's grace is much more than the impact of Adam's sin. That is phenomenal to me. And what that's teaching me is that, yes, God's grace is sufficient for us. However much we might feel that we're unworthy of the promises that God is willing to give us, if we'll believe in them, he's saying, my grace is sufficient for you. So what he then says in chapter 6 is, therefore... Make your baptism, the thing that you did when you got baptised, you said, I'm going to try to put to get death of flesh, and I'm going to try to live with the Lord Jesus Christ. Make that the reality of your life. Try to make those choices. Is that easy? No, chapter 7. The things you try to do, you don't do. The things you don't want to do, you do do. Okay? It's a real challenge. But chapter 8, 
There is so much on your side. If God be for us, who can be against us? That's Romans 8, okay? All things work together for good for those who love God. That's Romans 8. What a great chapter for helping us to see that God is on our side. So, Romans has taught us, we can't stand on our own merits. What God wants is faith. And then in chapters 9 to 11 of Romans, what we now are doing is looking ahead, in, in a way, to think about Israel. And what, having spent all that time demonstrating that what God wants is faith, we realise that that is exactly the same principle for Israel. And th the reason we're underlining this is because it makes a difference to how it is that we understand the restoration of Israel. Do we think that God is going to come back to Israel and simply just save them, or will God expect faith? And what I would suggest, and I'm sure the scriptures are saying this to us, is what God wants is faith. So faith has got to be cultivated in that nation. So here in Romans chapter 9, we realise that a remnant of the Jews will be saved. Uh, if you're in Romans 9, look down to verse 27, where we read, Isaiah cries concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant will be saved. Not all, a remnant will be saved. For he will finish his work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Isaiah saith, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we'd be made like Sodom and Gomorrah, we'd be utterly destroyed. It wasn't for the fact that there's going to be a seed, a remnant, that will be saved. What will be the basis of their salvation? How will they be saved? Look down to verse 33. Surely this is like a key principle. Behold, I lay in Zion. A stumbling stone, a rock of offence, the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. God requires faith. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Look how this is reiterated. Chapter 10 and verse 11. The scripture said, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord is over all, that's over all, is rich unto all that call upon him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How can they believe it? Then goes on in verse 14 to say. So, what we're thinking about is the fact that, yes, a remnant of Israel will be saved. The people who are going to be saved are those who have faith. But look now at verse 14 again, Romans 10, verse 14. How then... Shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And that is exactly what we want to try to discover this morning through this weekend. We want to know how it is that Israel, who's currently in a state of blindness, are going to come to share in the new covenant, in the gospel, in the promises. How will they be changed? How can they hear without a preacher? So the northern invader will come down. I thought about that this morning. Daniel 11, Ezekiel 38. And that will be the catalyst, won't it, for the Lord Jesus Christ going up to save Judah, uh, those the Jews living in the land, from that northern invader. There are some who believe that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to save the Jews of Judah and Jerusalem is what will generate faith in them. Just that they're being attacked, okay, they're under horrific time. We're going to think more about that in, in studies this evening and tomorrow. But it's going to be terrible for them. And when Jesus comes, they'll be so pleased to see him that they'll just say, great, we have a saviour. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that that is the faith that God requires. I think that God wants more than that. That God would be wanting people who are looking to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. And I think that this part of scripture is underlining that key principle. So if we look at verse 15, how does faith come? Does it remember, this is what God wants. God wants faith. That's the only basis of salvation. Look at verse 15. 
How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 16, they've not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So surely we learn from that, that someone needs to be sent. Okay, that's what we saw at the end of verse 14. How shall they hear without a preacher? It's through the preaching of the word that that person will cultivate faith in the nation. So we're dealing in principles here. The principle is that faith comes from hearing the word of God. Sadly, listening to the word of God doesn't mean that everyone will respond in faith. Though. Whether you are Jew or Gentile, it's a response to God's word that's the basis of salvation. Isn't it? That's what God wants, not just in terms of faith in saying, well, I've listened to the word of God. Faith is to listen to the word of God and to put it into practice in our lives. Well, the word has gone out. We see that in verse 18. I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. So in past, yes, it's true. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. The Jews should have known that God's purpose would involve others. You know, the Jews might look and think to themselves, oh, no, this is, we, we just believe that God is purely going to deal with us. That's not simply the case. Verse 19. Didn't Moses say, you know, go, look, look right back into history, Deuteronomy 32, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy by them which are no nation, and by a foolish people will I anger you. Now, interestingly, that is a citation from Deuteronomy chapter 32. And what I think is interesting is when you look at that citation, what you realise is the problem here is that they had no faith. That is this key point we're trying to get across here. That's the, the problem, their lack of faith. God looked to get a response out of Israel by bringing the Gentiles into the fold. But clearly, though, God still has a purpose with his people. And so if we keep reading, chapter 11 and verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? By no means, but certainly not. God has not cast off his people. Now, did you know this, that the last verses of chapter 10 that I just skipped, verses 20 and 21, has already revealed that God still has a purpose with his people Israel. Because, let's look at them. Isaiah 20, Isaiah, sorry, Romans 10, verse 20. Isaiah is very bold saith, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. And unto Israel he saith all day long, I've stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and again saying people. So here he's saying, God has a purpose and always did have a purpose with the Gentiles to come into the hope of Israel. But inciting Isaiah 65, anyone who knew Isaiah 65 would know that the answer to that question, has God cast off his people, has been answered. Let's go and see that. So come to Isaiah 65. Has God cast off his people? Romans 11 and verse 1. Of course he hasn't. You, if you'd have taken the time to look at Isaiah 65 in Romans 10 and verse 20 and 21, <laughs> you'd know that. So Isaiah 65, the verses that were cited were verses 1 and 2. So you can see that, just have a read through those verses and see how that's what's been cited in Romans 10 and verse 20 and 21. But now look down to verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Sharon shall be a fold of flocks, and the valley of Achor a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. So can you see how clear that is? Okay? God has a purpose still with Israel. The answer to Romans 11 and verse 1 
was given in the last two verses of Romans 10, in verse 20 and 21. So it's a rhetorical question because he's given the answer by no means and because he's proved it by taking us to Isaiah 65. So then, for faith, for this purpose with Israel to come about, okay, for God not to cast off his people, we've picked up that they need to hear the word. It's the word that can generate faith. How can they hear the word without a preacher? We realize that a preacher, a messenger is needed. One who will cultivate faith from the word. Who will be sent? <coughs> well, I believe that that someone is Elijah, who's spoken of immediately in Romans 11. How interesting is that? So look at Romans 11, verse two. What said the scripture of Elijah? So how interesting is it that in terms of thinking about the restoration of Israel, we're immediately drawn back to say, think about Elijah. And in this case, it's taking us back to when Elijah gave up with Israel. But we're going to see he has a role to come to help restore Israel. So how do we know that he's got this? role of restoration. Well, come with me to Malachi. This is perhaps the most uh, important verse, certainly it's in the Old Testament, that teaches us that Malachi, uh, that Elijah has a role. <clears throat> and really what we will do as we're going through our studies, in, that in terms of looking at the restoration of Israel, is see that very often there's echoes to what happened with Elijah. But really, this is the key verse that tells us that he is involved. So there's no doubt about it that he's involved. So Malachi 4, we read in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Just have a think to yourself what the great and dreadful day of the Lord would be. And he's saying, I'm going to send Elijah before that. So we think about that in terms of Armageddon, them coming down, and then the Lord God going out to save Judah. But I'm going to send Elijah before that. What's he going to do? He's going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth <laughs> with a curse. So we've got to try to understand those verses, haven't we? So verse 6 is making clear, isn't it, that Elijah's work is to turn the heart of the fathers to the children. So think about the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children so they recognise that this is actually their children and the children to their fathers. So he's trying to bring Israel back to the promises, back to their fathers. And he's going to do that, we'd suggest from verse 4, by showing them the promises from the Lord, from the parts of scripture that they would actually listen to. Think about Israel. What parts of scripture will they happily listen to? It's going to be the law of Moses. So it's almost no surprise, he said, remember the law of Moses, because that's actually, think about where we were this morning in Genesis, thinking about uh, Abraham. That's what they'll listen to, won't they? So through that, perhaps he'll talk through the sort of things we've been thinking about. Think about Abraham's faith. This is what Abraham believed. This is what you need to believe. But if we put these verses in Malachi in parallel with where they're cited in the New Testament, how helpful is this? And whenever you're doing study, realise that the New Testament is a commentary on the Old Testament. So always be willing when you see a citation to look it up and see when there's a difference, what am I supposed to learn from this? And here we're able to learn in a really helpful way. So he's going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children, no problem. And the disobedient, that must be the children, to the wisdom of the just, that must be the fathers. Can you see just the New Testament helping us now to understand what this means? So the disobedient are the children, the Jews, who are going to have their hearts turned to the wisdom of the just. Now we know, don't we, that the just shall live by faith. 
How important is that principle? We've seen it time and again. The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2 verse 4, Romans 1 verse 17, Galatians 3 verse 11, something like that. Uh, Hebrews 10, okay? The end of it, Hebrews 10. So, can you see how important that is? So, his work is to get the disobedient children, the Jews, to faith, to the wisdom of the just. That is what the wisdom of the just is. Faith in God. So Elijah's work will be to turn the heart of a nation, to cultivate faith in them. He's going to prepare the Jews to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through his preparation that they will recognise the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah. He has a role to restore all things. We'll, we'll come across that, to restore all things. Now, when John the Baptist went before the Lord Jesus Christ, he was working in the spirit and power of Elijah. So that is really, really important, isn't it? So John the Baptist, when he had a role to come and prepare the way for the Lord Jesus, what he was doing was working in the spirit and power of Elijah. And what our minds can sometimes do is think, hmm, I know about Elijah from back here, and John, how is he coming in the spirit and power of the Elijah that I know from history? And what I think we've got to understand here is that what he's coming in is the spirit and power of Elijah here. Is my little movements here making some sense? To about three of you. I'll try to explain again, okay? The spirit and power of Elijah that John is coming is the spirit and power of preparing for the Lord Jesus Christ. Elijah has a job to prepare for the Lord Jesus Christ, to prepare the Jews for when Jesus comes in his second coming, his ultimate coming. So when John came in the spirit and power of Elijah, he came in the spirit and power of the one who's going to prepare that way for the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense. Making sense now? That's six of you now, okay? We're getting there, okay? If it's not clear, then by all means, I, talk to me afterwards, but hopefully this will sort of come clear, that John's work was like in the spirit and power of the Elijah who's going to come, okay, which is the same Elijah, same character, but it's about that preparation of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. So Elijah can be described, okay, as the one which is to come, okay, that's the key, isn't it? It's not about simply thinking about Elijah. We're going to think about him in the past and see how that work was helping him in the past to prepare for his future work. But it's actually, that's the Elijah that we're thinking about, okay? Which is the same person. Was John Elijah? Some people would say, oh, yeah, but John the Baptist, he was Elijah. That's what he was. No, okay? There's the answer to that. Are you Elijah? I am not. Super simple, Okay. John was not Elijah, okay? His work is not a fulfillment of what's happening here. Elijah has a job. John's job was to fulfill that in, a, in some way, to demonstrate this is what Elijah will be doing, preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll see that John was foreshadowing that work as a voice crying in the wilderness. What does he cry? Well, flesh is grass. Let's go to Matthew. So we're in Malachi, easy peasy. Let's go to Matthew chapter 17. And here, directly after the transfiguration, where Elijah and Moses spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ about his exodus. Now, so Matthew 17, the first few verses are about the transfiguration. And... Yeah, we know for a fact that they spoke about his exodus. We know that. You can make a note from this. Uh, Luke 9 and verse 31. Okay, that's the parallel account. And that tells you they spoke about his exodus, his decease, the fact that he's going to die. Um, but that's what's needed to bring about, um, yeah, God's purpose. But here in Matthew 17, so directly after that, we see the disciples are interested, you know, about Elijah. So verse 10 says, his disciples asked him, saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? 
So they got this question, you know, why, why did the scribes say this? Verse 11, Jesus said, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah's come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So you can see from that, that's why some people would say, oh, John the Baptist, he just simply fulfilled the Elijah role. But we know, don't we, that he wasn't Elijah. John says, I'm not Elijah. So what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here is that John was a type of Elijah, but they, the Jews wouldn't listen to him. That's what's being said here. John was a type of Elijah to come. He was working to prepare the Jews for the Lord Jesus Christ. His work summarised the work that Elijah has to do. Now, looking back at the uh, first few verses of this chapter, we see Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus during the transfiguration. You see that in verse 3. We mentioned that it's Luke's Gospel, chapter 9 and verse 31, that we learned that they spoke about Jesus' decease, his exodus, now think about now why Moses and Elijah would be such appropriate people to speak to the Lord Jesus Christ about his exodus. Well, in Moses' case, it's really easy to think about, isn't it? Moses had led an exodus, okay? And of course, the exodus that he led was pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ's work in delivering us from Egypt and taking us to the Promised Land. So we see why Moses would be there and brought such a helpful support to the Lord Jesus Christ at this time. But Elijah, we're going to see in tomorrow's studies, has a future work to lead an exodus again, to bring the Jews from around the world back into their land. He will be the prophet that starts off the preaching work to the Jews in the kingdom age. So let's now go back to 1 Kings 17. This is where we first come across Elijah in the Bible. This is the historical record. And hopefully we're going to be able to see here that the work that Elijah was initially given to do was always a preparation for him. And you'll realise why it is that we're confident in suggesting that it's Elijah that will undertake this work. So hopefully you know a bit about the history of Elijah because we're going to sort of just whip through some things here. The first thing I want to point out is that Elijah brings life to a child. Oh my goodness me, I hope we could do Elijah now. Somebody's got on their way out by the sound of it. Um, Elijah, yeah, brings life to a child um, through breathing into him. So can you see that in uh, 1 Kings 17 and verse 21? Okay. He stretched himself upon the child, cried unto Yahweh and said, Oh Yahweh, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. So Elijah breathes into this child. Okay, The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, the soul of the child, came unto him again, and he revived. Okay, So this child revived. Now, interestingly, Ezekiel describes the rebirth <coughs> of Israel, okay, the resurrection of a nation as breath being breathed into their dry bones, okay? There's this word, that, this is the, the word we're looking at, to, where it says they revived, they lived, Ezekiel 37. We also note from this chapter that this took place, verse 8, and verse 9, sorry, in Zarephath. Now, Zarephath means, you've got it in your margin perhaps, refinement that's what it means and interestingly in Malachi 3 we're told that a messenger will precede the Lord Jesus Christ i.e the work of Elijah and it says of the Lord Jesus that he will be a refiner's fire we notice in chapter 18 in verse 1 that Elijah's appearance is associated with rain Okay, it's associated with rain. And you're going to see in studies that we do later today, Zechariah 10 in particular, 
how rain is associated with this work. He specifically says in chapter 18, gather to me all Israel. Okay, I think this is really an important point in our understanding of Elijah's work, that he's interested in all Israel. Okay, so look at verse 19. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel. So it's not a case of him being concerned just with the ten tribes, okay, even though it's the time of Jacob, of uh, a split in the kingdom of Israel, he's not just concerned with the northern kingdom, he's concerned with all Israel. And actually when he repairs the altar in verse 31, he took 12 stones, okay, he's interested in all Israel. So I think we can start to build a picture that Elijah has a work with all Israel. We see that he's, um, yeah, and I think perhaps you could tie that into when the Lord Jesus Christ said he has a role to restore all things. Okay, he's interested in all Israel. We notice his prayer in verse 36. So you remember this, the prophets of Baal have come, you know, they're trying to get fire down to see if they can uh, prove that Baal is a god. And of course, he's not a god at all. Nothing's going to happen. And then Elijah prays. And he says in verse 36, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came to him and said, O Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that thou art Yahweh God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Now, this was a clincher to me, that this is about Elijah having uh, a role here, which is teaching him about his role, which is to come. What's he doing? He's turning the hearts of the children to who? Verse 36, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. To the fathers, the heart of the children, to the fathers. That is what's going on here, isn't it? Okay. The Malachi 4 and verse 6, just look at it again, Verse the end of verse 37, you've turned their hearts again. That's what this is about. Amazing. Now, as the fire comes down from heaven and Elijah's sacrifice is consumed, the people turn, and what do they call out at the end of verse 39? Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And when you think about that, what they're shouting out is Elijah, Elijah. Now that is Elijah. So think about the breakdown of Elijah's name. Okay. El, God, Yah. Yahweh, he's God. Elijah. Okay. This is what it is that they're calling out here. As the name Zarephath was significant, so too we think the names in this chapter are significant because this took place in Carmel. Uh, see that in verse 42, uh, which means fruitful field or garden. So just uh, kind of hold on to that. Um, and then Elijah gets his, uh, on his way to Jezreel, which and I want you to kind of note these because these are going to come up in, in later studies, the importance of the names of these places. And uh, yeah, Jezreel, God sows, is something that comes up as an important place too, okay? We noted that Elijah... Uh, has kind of got this role to come before the Lord Jesus Christ. And here, we also see that he becomes a forerunner to the king, in this case, uh, a wicked king in, in Ahab. And Jezebel, this, this grim woman, this, this witch of a woman, who is associated with false religion and whoredoms, yet wonderfully what we're going to see is that later, the threat of Jezebel is not going to stop Elijah looking to convert in the future. So Elijah's going to kind of go out with immortal strength when dealing with the threat of Jezebel-type systems. What, one last kind of scriptural echo that I see here, which I think is a great one, is that we see here a cloud coming up like a man's hand. So we've seen that in verse 44. And Daniel 5 tells us that the, man, the fingers of a man's hand brought about the literal fall of Babylon pronounce judgment on that system. So I think Elijah, with us, will see the, the fall of figurative Babylon the Great, the mother 
of harvests. Now just think, when you're seeing these kind of echoes, you can't help but think, oh, maybe there's something that we can learn here too. So to me, this is pretty thrilling, kind of looking through these things a few years ago now. But the tragedy at this point in history is that Elijah, right now, gives up, believing that only he is left. And in chapter 19, we see how an angel comes to him and, and gives him sustenance, tries to help him to get to horror. Uh, it is a journey which takes him some 40 days and 40 nights. And we pick up in 1 Kings 19, verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again the second time, touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat, 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb. So he comes to Horeb. As he makes his journey, it seems that God is working to draw Elijah's mind to the experience of Moses. So there's some connections taking us back to Moses on Horeb when he stood in that cleft of that rock and the Lord Yahweh passed by. Why was Elijah being brought back? to this time. Well, think about it. Think about Elijah and Moses there at the transfiguration, thinking about an exodus. So now in verse 11, we see Elijah stood on the mount as the Lord passes by. It says, go forth, stand upon the mount before Yahweh, and behold, Yahweh passed by, and the great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before Yahweh. But Yahweh is not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but Yahweh was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But Yahweh was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So why was Elijah put through this? Well, I wonder if it's for two reasons. The first is because God is telling Elijah that great and dreadful things have got to happen before the sound of gentle stillness. We'll see in a moment prophecies speaking about the return of the Jews to the land, that momentous events described in terms of earthquake, wind and fire will precede the kingdom age. But the second reason I wonder is this, that Elijah himself needed to learn that his role wouldn't be in the dramatic, but rather the voice. Through the still small voice, Elijah will be converting the Jews in the land, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus really is their Messiah. And you know, I think that's a really good lesson for our own preaching. It's very simple. Speak the word. Talk to people about the word of God and how amazing it is. Don't worry about thinking that you've got to do some great act. Romans 9, you don't need to go to the depths of the sea, you don't need to climb the highest mountains. Speak the word of God. Now, of course, because Elijah is the one person who is named, okay, in the restoration, we've seen that from Matthew 17, we've seen that from Malachi 4, we refer to it as the work of Elijah, but in reality, I think that it could be that there are more immortal people who will join him. You remember that John the Baptist had disciples working with him. We know that from Matthew 9 in verse 14. Elijah himself worked with a group known as the sons of the prophets. So when the Lord Jesus speaks of gathering the elect, he says he will send out his messengers. And interestingly, that word messengers is the word that's used as messengers in Luke 7 and verse 24 that's just describing people. In fact, John's people, okay? So we think that it's not unfair to suggest that actually Elijah's work may well bring a group of people, okay? How big the group is, I don't know, who will go and get this preaching work uh, done in Israel to help prepare them for the Lord Jesus Christ's coming. The last thing that we want to look at this morning comes again from Malachi 4. Come with me back to there. So this, this study, I think we're going to be finishing early. Never quite sure when you put these notes down how long things will take to go through. But let's go to Malachi 4. <coughs> so 
So, in Malachi chapter 4, we realise that Elijah needs to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay, so there in verse 5. We're confident that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is speaking about Armageddon. Okay? A huge national judgment in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And the passage also makes clear the end of verse 6 that Elijah's teaching will avert a curse. And what I found difficult when I was studying this at first is Armageddon is described as a curse. So there in Zechariah 14, just a couple of you know, chapters back, that same word in the Hebrew is used describing Armageddon. But here's the difficulty. Elijah's teaching does not avert Armageddon. Armageddon is going to happen. Absolutely no doubt about it. So then I'm thinking to myself, so what is the curse that Elijah's teaching does avert? Yeah, you see the logic of this question? I'm trying to see, what is the curse that Elijah's teaching is going to avert? We know that it's not going to be Armageddon. Armageddon is going to happen. Well, that word curse is translated utterly destroyed many, many times. But here I'm picking out one in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 21. And this is when Saul, as the first king of Israel, was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites. So I think we can make a suggestion from this, okay? And it is a suggestion, but you know, go with it, see what you think. I suggest that as the Lord Jesus Christ sets up the kingdom, the land would be utterly, utterly destroyed by him if there was no faith. So if Israel was as it was now, with a faithless general people living there, when the Lord Jesus Christ would come, he would utterly destroy it. As Saul, as the first king, was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites, be absolutely raised to nothing. But Elijah's teaching will avert that curse. It won't be utterly, utterly destroyed. It will be destroyed, but not utterly destroyed because the Lord Jesus Christ will go to save the faithful remnant that Elijah's work has brought about. So if Elijah's teaching hadn't turned a remnant, then I believe that the land would have to be absolutely desecrated. And that would add to the terribleness of Armageddon. But it would be necessary to purge the land before the setting up of the kingdom. But as Romans 9 said, where we started off, citing Isaiah 1, speaking of Judah and Jerusalem, he says, a remnant shall be saved. And except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you see what I mean? Utterly destroyed, wiped off the face as it were. Can't even find them. We're absolutely desecrated. But because of Elijah's teaching, he averts that curse. That as it is, so therefore God sends the Lord Jesus Christ with the saints into the land to save the faithful remnant. That's their mission, to go to save those people. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. Elijah will turn a remnant, they'll have faith, Jesus will complete the work by coming to save them. So therefore, we'd expect Jesus to return to the earth, the resurrection to happen, the judgment to happen, and then, we're not saying that God is going to give Elijah some special resurrection and some special judgment that will proceed 
us. We know from Hebrews 11 that all those, including Elijah, who have died in faith, are waiting together, that together we might receive the promises. So Elijah will be raised like we will be raised if we die before the Lord Jesus comes again. If we haven't died, we'll be called with them, that together we receive the promises. We'll go through the judgment. Elijah then will be sent, okay? And th there's a period of time, you know, we can sort of talk about that, but, you know, in, in the end, it becomes kind of a little bit conjecturish in my mind, okay? But there's certainly a period of time. We don't have to see these things. There's a, like the judgment happening, and then two seconds later, we have to go to, 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 to save Israel. It's a period of time. Do you think in that period of time, Elijah, with others too, sent him to Israel to help them? And we're going to see you in our passages this afternoon or later this evening, okay? Just how clear those passages are that there are people in the land helping the Jews to help them to see that their salvation is coming in the Lord Jesus Christ. So then the Lord Jesus Christ will go with the saints up to save that faithful remnant from the northern invader that's coming down. So I believe that that is where Elijah's work fits in. In our later study, we'll look at it in a bit more detail.